This is iFaith83. The next few video sermons will come from the books of Chronicles. We've just had four messages from 1st and 2nd Kings, and now we'll have four messages from Chronicles, which are written a couple centuries after the book of Kings and focus nearly entirely on the southern kingdom of Judah, whereas Kings alternates between northern Israel and southern Judah, Chronicles is focused on the southern kingdom, and particularly how each king did compared to David and Solomon. The view of those kings is very positive. Oh, some of their weaknesses are recorded, but nowhere near as many as in the book of Kings. This is an accurate perspective, but it's just a more positive perspective than we find in the other books. Well, David has, of course, captured Jerusalem. He has brought the ark into the city. And actually, he has made a lot of plans for a temple because up until this time, there's been the tabernacle. There's been basically a portable tent, but they want something more solid, something enduring uh, for Jerusalem. And so we're going to be reading today from 1 Chronicles 17, which is probably the key chapter in the entire book. We'll read part of it this time and part of it next time. The message is entitled, David's Two Houses, Part 1, Dealing with Disappointment. After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan replied to David, Whatever you have in mind, do it, for God is with you. Now, David has built his own home, and it's time to build the house of God. The word house is the word for temple. Just like in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, you'll see the, the, the phrase place. The place will refer to the temple. But the house, it's God's house. I think that makes sense. And David is willing. Uh, in fact, he's prayed about this. Psalm 132 talks about this, among other places. But he's really prayed. And so Nathan, and this is a very honest, godly man. This is the prophet who challenged David about his adultery with Bathsheba. Nathan says, whatever you have in mind, do it. God's with you. It must have been very encouraging um, as David went to bed that evening. <laughs> but we continue. That night, the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. You are not the one to build me a house to dwell in. I have not dwelt in a house from the day that I brought Israel up out of Egypt. To this day, I have moved from one tent site to another, from one dwelling place to another. It seems to me that constructing the temple and seeing this project concluded was the most important thing in David's life, at least to him. Now, he had done many things. He had fought Goliath. He had brought the nation together. He captured Jerusalem, brought the Ark of the Covenant there. But it's not complete until there's a temple. I mean, this is the climax. This is the culmination of his work. And he's put his heart into it. And yet he's told, you're not the one. Well, God tells that to Nathan. Nathan will tell David. I will say, David did a lot of things wrong. This is the great thing about the Bible. It gives us a, a view of the key persons that's not whitewashed. It's not uh, painted over to make them look like something they're not. We see the weaknesses. We see David's weaknesses. We see his strengths. But dealing with disappointment, uh, being adaptable, being flexible, that's not one of his weaknesses. He handles disappointment really well. And once again, he had zealously made preparations for this uh, construction project for the temple, and yet God rejected his well-intended plan. Now, this applies to so many things. That is, looking at how David deals with disappointment. Surely, if you're like me, there have been times in your past where you've been deeply disappointed by a friend or family member, or maybe you didn't get the mark you wanted in an examination. Uh, for me, certainly in my ministry, it's always disappointing when people resist biblical training. But we all have our disappointments. We deal with that. It might be in the area of work. You're, this was not the job that you envisioned. Or you thought you would have this forever, but you really want to spend the rest of your life doing this? Work, the workplace 
even if you work from home, is an arena where there can be disappointment. How about your finances? How about marriage? How about family, children, other relationships, your, where our own health, uh, projects that we, that we begin, that we want to complete, but, but often they're interrupted somehow. We are disappointed in our faith, and to be frank, we can be disappointed in God, although we rarely will admit that. And certainly, we can be disappointed with church, or with church leaders, something we're probably more willing to admit. But all of us deal with this. Disappointment is part of life. But for David, this is a big one. Now, I want you to notice um, uh, his response after Nathan has spoken to him. David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem. King David rose to his feet and said, listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of God, for the footstool of our Lord. And I had made plans to build it. But God said to me, you're not the one to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Uh, just to clarify, a house for God's name. The name represents who God is, his essence, his authority. Uh, uh, obviously, God cannot be put inside a house. And when Solomon dedicates the temple, that's a key point in his prayer in 2 Chronicles 6 and 1 Kings 8. The highest heavens cannot contain God, much less a temple, no matter how impressive. Anytime we think we've got the corner on God, we've got him in our box, we've, we're, we've got him wrapped up and he's in our formula or our creed, uh, we're in trouble. You can't do that to God. Okay, that's just extra. David continues, Yahweh said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts. For I've chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever if he is unswerving in carrying out my commands and laws. The passage I just read to you is from 1 Chronicles 28. Notice uh, God says, Solomon will be my son. Well, in, in the ancient world, when a king ascended to the throne, it was very often described as an adoption by God. Psalm 2 uh, uh, is a good example of this. So when you become the king, you're, you become God's son. There's that connection between being son of God and king. Of course, it's much more in, intimate in the case of Jesus. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. What have we just read? Well, David is not permitted to build the temple because he shed much blood. Now, he's not criticized for having been a warrior. Remember, the first two kings, Saul and David, were mighty warriors. Solomon was not. Under Solomon's reign, the kingdom expanded, but he wasn't a fighter. In fact, his name sounds like, and is related to, the word for peace. Peace is shalom. Solomon is shlomo. Shlomo, shalom. They're, they're clearly connected. So, but David, because of the bloodshed, and this gives us some insight, some intimation of what God thinks about war and killing enemies in the New Testament. But we won't get into that right now. But he's not permitted to build the temple. It's going to be Solomon. And Solomon is going to be planning and, and executing this project that will bring into existence maybe the most beautiful building of the ancient world. Now, you might wonder, Douglas, didn't you say this message is called David's Two Houses? Yes. So what are the two houses? Well, the first is the temple that David wanted to build, but he's not permitted to build it. What's the other house? Is that his house? Well, you'll have to wait until the next message, and you'll understand what the second house is. But for now, I'd like us to look at David, a man after God's own heart, Look at David, and let's see how this can help us as we look at his dealing with disappointment. We face disappointing situations. Sometimes we may have a deep conviction that God wants us to do something when actually he does it. Or maybe it's a good thing, but it's not the time, or we're not the people to do it. Hasn't that ever happened to you? You had a great plan and you prayed about it. Maybe you fasted about it and it didn't happen. 
it wasn't God's will. Now, naturally, times like that can be very disappointing, even humiliating, especially if the person who does get to do it is someone less experienced than us, maybe a lot younger, or maybe someone that you know we don't know very well. Well, that kind of disappointment is common to all humans. Another area is limitations from our past. Now, somehow, we're not told quite how, but killing in battle had tainted David. Shedding blood was, in a sense, unholy. Past decisions affect present possibilities. So we have a past, and in Christ, yes, we get a, a fresh start. We're new creations. But it doesn't mean that the clock is somehow rewound and there are no consequences to our previous actions. Yes, we can do all things in Christ, Philippians 4. But that's not all things literally. These are all things that God wants us to do. We all have limitations. And these may be from our upbringing, from our education, from uh, emotional baggage, from difficult relationships. This could be brain chemistry, just the way we're wired. Um, limitations, how tall you are, how short you are, uh, how you are at connecting with people. But we all have limitations. And that's okay. Because God's not asking us all to live identical lives. Some people will do something, some will do other things. Here's a, another takeaway for me, bouncing back. Have you ever experienced crushing disappointment? I mean, disappointment where you were so low you could hardly be around other people or, or maybe around the person who disappointed you. It can be very difficult if you've been through that. But despite crushing disappointment, David adjusts. His heart is flexible. And more than that, he is fully behind God's decision. Yahweh has decided Solomon, David's son, will build the temple. And David gives Solomon his full support, not half-hearted support. He gives him moral support. He gives him detailed instructions. He gives him financial support, lots of encouragement. We read about that in the final chapters of First Chronicles. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't have an attitude. He's not pretending to be okay when he's not. He actually is okay. Wow. He backs the building plan financially, even though David will not live to see the construction of the temple. It won't be completed until after his death in his son's reign, in Solomon's reign. One more thing I see with David, it's this balance, it's grace. David, in this instance, carries himself uh, in an exemplary way. He's a great example for us. He's spiritual. I mean, just look at, read chapter 29, you'll see that. You know, because we live in a messed up world, a fallen world, we all have to deal with unfair situations, uh, surprises that are unpleasant, uh, reversals of circumstance, unjust actions, decisions that others make that are wrong, that affect us. Sometimes we can do nothing about it. And there's so many things that can lead us to deep disappointment. And yet God understands. He understands that. And we need to understand that it's not always going to go our way. We need to have the kind of grace that David shows here. And that's why I call this message, David's Two Houses, part one, dealing with disappointment. Next time, you'll learn what the other house is and a really important biblical theme. God bless you.